What up space fam goes in here from anime opera and today I'm going to be going over every single Yonko in history aka the four emperors of the sea and their powers. This will be an updated version since things have changed a lot since I first made this video over two and a half years ago and yes I put more than four in the title because we are discussing as I mentioned all Yonko in history not just the ones currently holding the positions. As most of us probably know the Yonko are largely considered to be the captains of the four strongest power crews in the world. Back in the day I would have said the four strongest living pirates but with recent events in the story and I'm thinking about a certain clown right now that description just wouldn't be that accurate. If you guys want to see more updated videos like this one about the warlord supernova and more let me know by smashing that like button and leaving a comment. If you haven't made this the video you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future One Piece videos and updates and now without further ado let's jump into it spoilers and all. Let's start with Edward Newgate aka White Beard, the man who was widely known as the strongest man in the world and the man closest to the One Piece after the Pirate King's death. At 72 years old, Whitebeard was one of the most epic old dudes in anime before his death in the battle at Marineford, which was probably my favorite arc in all of One Piece. Although I must say after what happened in Wano, the Wano arc is definitely up there. It's worth mentioning that like two other Yonko on this list, Charlotte Lenlin and Kaido, Whitebeard used to be a member of the Rocks Pirates. They were led by Captain Rocks and they were considered to be the strongest pirate crew until the rise of Goldie Roger. The fact that at one point three out of four of the old era Yonko who ruled over the new world were from the same crew shows how insanely strong it must have been at least in regards to raw power. Whitebeard possessed the Gura Gura no Mi, Oda stated that this fruit was the strongest Paramecia fruit. Sengoku proclaims at one point that with this fruit, Whitebeard has the power to destroy the world. The power lets Whitebeard produce shockwaves that can travel through practically anything, air, water, and land. The shockwaves can cause tsunamis and earthquakes. The shockwaves can be unpredictable, so allies have to be cautious around the user and not get in his way. Whitebeard was able to split an island in half, creating a giant chasm to separate the pirates on one side from the marines on the other. He uses the power to destroy the navy headquarters, but the power is not limitless. The navy has created walls stronger than steel that won't shatter as a result of the Gura Gura no Mi power. Whitebeard can create vibrations around himself to protect himself. Because of this ability, Aoki Kiji can't freeze him. Whitebeard can concentrate his power into a small orb or quake bubble around his hand to increase its power. He can create contained but powerful explosion type attacks. He used this attack to beat a giant vice admiral with one blow. He destroyed his helmet like it was nothing. He can surround his spear with a quake bubble and use it to extend its reach. He can mow down enemies far away in this fashion. Perhaps the most interesting power is Whitebeard's ability to grab the air and pull it. By doing so he tilted the entire battlefield at Marineford. Whitebeard can also use all three types of hockey, including armament hockey, observation hockey, and the rarest of all, conqueror's hockey. Armament hockey allows him to increase his defense and attack, and allows him to injure Logia users that are otherwise immune to physical attacks. Observation hockey lets the user sense someone's presence when they are concealed or far away, and can even allow one to foresee the future to an extent. Lastly, as mentioned, conqueror's hockey is the most rare, only one in several million people have it, although it definitely seems more common now nowadays, especially after Wano, it allows the user to exert his willpower over others, which can cause people to straight up faint and animals to run away. Whoever possesses Conqueror's Hockey possesses the attributes of a king, so you could say that they are a born leader. When Whitebeard was younger and stronger, his hockey was strong enough to match that of the Pirate Kings. Without even touching, the clash of hockey alone created insanely strong wins. Whitebeard did eventually die, but he remained standing nonetheless, a true boss. He was old and sick, so despite how impressive he was, at Marine Ford, we should keep in mind that that was not Whitebeard in his prime. And in this update, I will include all the bounties of the Yonko, since now, thank God, we have access to them all. Whitebeard's was the highest of all Yonko in history at 5.046 billion before he was taken out. It's notable that if you combined any two Yonko on this list, they'd already have a higher combined bounty number than Goldie Roger's bounty, which was 5.5648 billion. This gives us a sense of how strong the Yonko are and why they were considered to be one of the three great powers before the warlord system was abolished. They should still be considered one of the two great powers if you ask me. Anyways, Blackbeard stole Whitebeard's overpowered devil fruit along with his title of Yonko. Thus in theory, he can learn to use all of Whitebeard's moves centered around this devil fruit. So this seems like a good time to look at Marshall D. Teach aka Blackbeard and his powers in more detail next. Blackbeard is easily one of the most fascinating characters in anime. In the battle at Marineford, every side seemed to lose except Blackbeard 
Beard who managed to come out as the winner. He is 40 years old after the time skip and he is the first person in history to wield two different devil fruits. That's impressive, even before taking into account the amazing caliber of those two devil fruits. Now that he possesses Whitebeard's power to destroy the world, along with his own dark dark fruit, he doesn't seem that crazy when he says stuff like, I'm invincible and I'm the greatest. After he stole the power from Whitebeard, he proclaimed that his era was beginning. Just like Rox had his era and Goldie Roger had his era. Blackbeard is all the more entertaining because there seems to be some truth behind his ridiculously ambitious proclamations. And that becomes more and more clear as time goes on. We went through the powers of the Gura Gura no Mi when we talked about Whitebeard, so let's focus now on the Yami Yami no Mi aka the Dark Dark Fruit here. It is said to be the most dangerous power in the history of all devil fruits. It's classified as a Logia type fruit and it lets Blackbeard become a darkness man, allowing him to create, control, and transform into darkness. Blackbeard can use his darkness power to suck in an entire town. According to Blackbeard, his dark gravity power compresses objects with infinite power and crushes them. He can then release the wreckage from his darkness. Interestingly enough, the dark dark fruit doesn't allow Blackbeard to avoid damage like other Logia users. As he points out to Ace, the darkness sucks in everything, whether it's punches, blades, bullets, fire, or lightning. This has led me to speculate that it might not be a Logia at all, it might actually be a mythical zone. Link to that theory in the description. However, since that is not confirmed, let's just stick with the Logia idea for now. His body absorbs all pain, and that pain is even amplified in the process. But in exchange for that, the Dark Dark Fruit lets him pull in the actual body of Devil Fruit users, and when he's touching them, he can absorb their powers. So when he punches Ace while holding him with his other arm, Ace can't use the Flame Flame Fruit to avoid the attack. As we find out during the battle at Marineford, Blackbeard can also absorb Devil Fruit powers for himself, as we saw when he stole Whitebeard's Devil Fruit. Now yes, we don't know how exactly he absorbed Whitebeard's Fruit, but since his Dark Dark Fruit can already suck in Devil Fruit users, and as I mentioned, absorb their powers temporarily, I don't think it's a stretch to think that his Dark Dark Fruit power is related to his unique ability to steal other Devil Fruits as well. Blackbeard is so powerful that he actually managed to give the Yonko Shanks the scars he has over his left eye. And Shanks insists that it wasn't because he was careless, it was because Blackbeard is that dangerous. Shanks even tells the legend Whitebeard not to go after Blackbeard because of how dangerous he is. Imagine telling that to the guy who's called the strongest man in the world and the one closest to the One Piece. Back when he became a Yonko, Blackbeard's bounty was actually the lowest of the Yonko at 2.2476 billion berries. Today things have changed though. He now has a bounty of 3.996 billion. His new bounty is only second to one of the current Yonko and that's Shanks, whose bounty is only a bit higher as we'll get into later. It should be noted that pre-time skip Blackbeard was often one to understate and hide his true power. He willingly hid behind Whitebeard when it suited his purposes. In the old version of my video, I mentioned that Blackbeard's then bounty of 2.2 billion, although high, did not adequately reflect how dangerous he actually was. And his new updated bounty seems to confirm that, although I feel confident that even with his bounty being so close to Shanks's already, Blackbeard's only getting stuck. Started. It's also interesting to note that Blackbeard, even back in the day, was powerful enough to be a commander for the Whitebeard Pirates even before he had a Devil Fruit, but he declined, preferring to stay low key at the time. Blackbeard is confirmed to be able to use Armament and Observation Hockey. He hasn't been confirmed to be a Conqueror's Hockey user yet, but I think it's only a matter of time before it's revealed that he is, in fact, a Conqueror's Hockey user. Marco has stated that Blackbeard's body is odd, and that maybe explains how he could use two Devil Fruit powers at the same time. People say Blackbeard doesn't even sleep. Sleep. He survived attacks from Ace, a confrontation with Shanks, a quake bubble around his head from Whitebeard, and more, and he survived without any significant lasting injuries. It's clear that his body is superhuman. However, what is perhaps even more dangerous about him is his mind. His ability to strategize makes him, in my view, very dangerous and very interesting. He was able to outsmart everyone. He set up events so that he'd be able to get the Dark Dark Devil Fruit, which he was willing to patiently wait about two decades for. That level of patience is insane, and all that time he was able to convince everyone that he was not ambitious at all. Then he became a warlord of the sea so that he could break some ridiculously OP people out of prison and add them to his crew. He set things up so that the pirates would fight the marines while he swooped in to take Whitebeard's devil fruit when the old man was almost dead. He got his way and he was smart enough to not fight Shanks when he showed up and ended the war. His mind and patience are what got him to this point. He's like a chess master on the world stage and seeing his plans come together is one of the most interesting 
things about the entire series in my view. He is definitely a worthy antagonist for Luffy to eventually face off against. Most recently, we saw Blackbeard go after Boa's Devil Fruit and his bounty was already 3.996 billion before he decided to do this. The Dark King Rayleigh showed up and saved Boa from Blackbeard, but as usual, Blackbeard wins even when he appears to lose. Rather than coming up empty-handed, Blackbeard ends up kidnapping Marine Captain Kobe instead, who is considered to be a Marine hero. Furthermore, the 78-year-old Rayleigh hypes up Blackbeard by saying that at his age, he couldn't have possibly won against Blackbeard. They were actually lucky, he argues, that the particulars of the situation made it possible for him to save Boa at all. So Blackbeard's bounty may go up again real soon after these recent events, and an old legend like Rayleigh speaking so highly of Blackbeard also goes a long way in hyping up his character. He seems to have come a long way from the guy who needed to gang up with his crew to finish off an old, injured, and sick Whitebeard. Next, let's look at Kaido of the Beasts, the man who was referred to as the strongest creature in the world. His bounty was 4.6111 billion berries, meaning he had the highest known bounty of any living Yonko before he was defeated by Luffy. People often used to say that if it's a one-on-one -on -one battle, Kaido will win. When Whitebeard was alive, Kaido actually tried to attack him but Shanks interfered. Clearly, Kaido was not only strong but brave as well. Brave enough to go after Whitebeard, that is. But how Shanks got him to turn around has yet to be revealed. We'll speculate about it though when we get to Shanks' part, so just wait for that. Although no one could say that Kaido wasn't strong, he definitely wasn't as good at strategizing as Blackbeard, and so he never seemed like as much of a threat to me. Still, he has one of the best introductions in anime. He is introduced as a man searching for a place to die. We are told that he's been caught by the Navy or enemy ships no less than 18 times. He was tortured time and time again and lived as a prisoner. When they tried to hang him, the rope snapped. When put under the guillotine, the blade cracked. Then he attempted to end himself by jumping off from Sky Island, but he survived. Not even Kaido could kill Kaido, that's how invincible he seemed. And on a side note, I think he's still alive, but more on that later. Anyways, I don't know if there's been a better introduction to an OP character than this. Kaido isn't strong because he wants to be, he practically views his overpoweredness as an annoyance at times, which is pretty hilarious. He has a reputation for being unable to die despite his best efforts. The first fight against Kaido and Luffy was a significant one. We are used to protagonists fighting, struggling, but ultimately overcoming their opponents. However, this is not what happens during this first fight. And I'm not saying it's the first time Oda did this, but it's still noteworthy. Luffy hits Kaido with many attacks, and Kaido is ultimately not hurt by it. Then Kaido hits Luffy with his club once, and Luffy is out cold. It's refreshing to see that pure willpower isn't enough to overpower a strong opponent sometimes. It doesn't happen often in shonen manga, but Kaido was able to brutally embarrass our shonen protagonist, and that really showed how strong and special of an antagonist he was. It took Luffy mastering a higher level of hockey, specifically the ability to emit hockey rather than just coating his body in hockey, and awakening his secret god fruit to finally beat Kaido. And again, I don't think Kaido is dead, but he was definitely defeated. Some people say Kaido took a bunch of damage beforehand and that's why Luffy won, but the damage he took from the scabbers, Yamato, and so on was not significant to someone as durable as Kaido, and he still kept beating Luffy for a long while until Luffy finally awakened his fruit. Point being, Luffy deserves the credit for beating Kaido, the so-called strongest creature in the world, and the Yonko with the highest bounty at the time in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Now let's get to Kaido's Devil Fruit, which is a mythical zone type fruit. Since the last version of this video, we found out its exact name, the Uo Uo no Mi Model Seryu, aka the Fish Fish Fruit Model Azure Dragon. As a Fish Fish Fruit, it raises certain questions, like was Kaido unable to end himself because he could even breathe in the sea, even if he may have been paralyzed like other fruit users? Also, if you didn't know, the reason Kaido looks like a dragon despite having a fish fish fruit is because it's based off of the Dragon Gate myth, where if a carp made it up a nearly impossible to climb waterfall, it would become a dragon. Think Magikarp and Gyarados from Pokemon. Because of this myth, I think it would be really cool if Kaido had to awaken his fruit before he could attain the cool dragon form. The fruit, as alluded to, allows him to transform into a giant, and I mean giant, blue eastern dragon. He also has a hybrid form that he seems to use most often during the course of an intense battle. He can shoot heat blasts from his dragon mouth that can cause devastating damage. He can create slices of wind that can cut off limbs tornadoes, lightning, and even hail in the video games. His ace in the hole is a technique that allows him to surround his whole dragon body in fire so that he melts everything that comes into contact with him. The only way to beat him in this case is through hockey mastery. If Luffy didn't learn to emit his hockey, he would have had to touch Kaido with his final attack, in which case he would have certainly lost, 
due to the intense heat. We also saw Kaido clashing with fellow Yonko Big Mom. As with Luffy, they both use Conqueror's Hockey, that rare hockey that allows the user who possesses the qualities of a king to exert his willpower over others. As mentioned, it can straight up cause weaker willed people to faint or large creatures to run away. Shanks, Whitebeard, Luffy, and others all also possess Conqueror's Hockey. And in fact, the only Yonko that have yet to be confirmed as Conqueror's Hockey users are Blackbeard and Buggy. And Buggy doesn't even necessarily need Need to have it since he's not even the strongest on his crew, as we'll get into. But as mentioned, I truly believe Blackbeard has it, it just needs to be revealed still. Anyways, when Kaido and Big Mom clashed, the heavens split open, just like when Whitebeard and Shanks clashed. That sort of seems like a sign of Yonko hood, if you will, when you can do that against a fellow Yonko. Interestingly enough, Kaido and Big Mom seem to be pretty evenly matched in battle, although obviously the battle could have gone a lot further, and they probably could have tried a lot harder. They eventually decided to team up and take over the world together. After that, they planned to finish their fight to the death. Very heartwarming stuff. However, as we saw, they were defeated by the combined forces of Luffy, Law, and Kid. Next, let's look at the 68-year-old Big Mom aka Charlotte Linlin, the Yonko who clashed evenly with the strongest creature in the world at the time, and for a time. Her own bounty was 4.388 billion berries, but I can't see it staying the same after her defeat against Law and Kid. Big Mom, like Kaido, definitely doesn't come off as calculating and patient as Blackbeard. She has been known to destroy entire countries over sweets. Almost everyone, including her own children, fears her when she's angry. Like Kaido, she was born powerful rather than trying to become powerful. When she was five, she accidentally killed a large bear by smacking it, making the epic Takamura from Hajime no Ippo look like a joke. She even broke the bones of a giant by trying to slap a mosquito. Like with Kaido, her overpoweredness seemed more like an annoyance than a goal, at least in the beginning. Even as a kid, she could break a skilled giant's sword with her fist and then defeat him. I could keep going, but you get the point. She's very, very strong, and naturally so. Her devil fruit is a paramecia type called Soru Soru no Mi, aka Soul Soul Fruit. The fruit allows her to take the soul of whoever she touches and take years away from their lifespan. Obviously, if she takes enough years, the victim will die right then and there. The ability is super OP, but there is a loophole. If you have no fear, you will not be affected by the devil fruit powers. Thus, if you want to even hope to stand a chance against her, you better have mastery over yourself and your fear. She can also put souls into inanimate objects or animals. Those newly anthropomorphized beings are known as homies, and you can see them all around Toto land. It's noteworthy that Big Mom cannot put souls into corpses or other people. The fruit can also produce little incarnations of pure soul that go around collecting and distributing souls for Big Mom. Big Mom used parts of her own soul to create four special homies that are far more powerful than the rest. These homies include Zeus, the thundercloud that is summoned by her left hand, Prometheus, the sun that is summoned by her right hand, and Napoleon who takes the form of Big Mom's hat. The sun can create flames, the cloud can create lightning bolts, and together they can manipulate the weather. It should be noted that recently Zeus Zeus, who's been more associated with Nami as of late than Big Mom, has been replaced by a new thundercloud homie called Hera. Thus the reason I earlier said four special homies rather than three. Big Mom's hat can turn into a blade that she can wield or that can move and attack by itself. Her hat can also relay information to her that it receives from the other homies. Homies like clouds can be ridden on and allow Big Mom to travel at high speeds. Prometheus can also engulf Napoleon in flames, increasing the power of the sword. Furthermore, the sword can release powerful destructive shockwaves. Most recently, during her fight against Law and Kid, she used a year of her own lifespan to increase her power even further. She gets even bigger, more godlike, as she dominates the panel compared to the now insect-looking Kid and Law. It's an ace in the hole that she doesn't use often, but as she mentioned, it has been decades since she's felt pain like the pain Kit and Law delivered to her, so she feels it's warranted. She also uses the Master Saber combination of Prometheus, Hera, and Napoleon to create Misery, an even more powerful homie. The giant powerful creation can fly around quickly while launching fire or lightning attacks. In short, Big Mom and her powers are definitely larger than life. Big Mom can also use all three hockey types, Conqueror's Hockey, Armament Hockey, and Observation hockey. Her armament hockey could easily withstand a punch from past Luffy's powerful fourth gear. However, the combined awakened powers of Law and Kid were just too much for her. Again, I don't think she's dead, but she was defeated, and in a sense, her fight was less fair than Kaido's because she was double teamed while Kaido got a one-on-one -on -one fight in the end. 
Now let's get to red-haired Shanks. He's definitely one of my favorite characters and I love the way Oda has constructed him. After the defeat of Big Mom and Kaido, he's the current Yonko with the highest bounty at 4.0489 billion berries. Red-haired Shanks is currently 39 years old in the manga and he was 27 years old in chapter 1 when the story began. He used to be a member of the Roger Pirates when he was younger, serving under the Pirate King himself. What fascinates me the most about Shanks is how Oda is able to build so much hype around him without revealing too much about his power. We didn't see anything crazy from his 27 year old self. Although we didn't know what it was back then, we did see him use Conqueror's Hockey to scare off the Sea King after it took his arm off. Later, when we see him approaching Whitebeard, his hockey power is enough to make many of Whitebeard's skilled pirates pass out. When Whitebeard and Shanks clash, just as when Kaido and Big Mom clash, they split the heavens, suggesting their otherworldly level of power. Then, most recently, we saw Admiral Greenbull's reaction to Shanks' hockey. When Greenbull was set on getting to Luffy through Momo, Yamato, and the Scabbards, it was Shanks' hockey that stopped him. Shanks didn't even have to stop at Wano, just being nearby and letting Greenbull sense his conqueror's hockey led to Greenbull seemingly screaming out in pain, asking, Who's doing that? The red haired pirates, are you nearby? End quote. His his crew even had to tell Shanks to take it easy since his sudden hockey blast got the new guys foaming from the mouth. Greenbull for his part wants none of it. He raises his hands in submission and says that he's not picking a fight with Shanks, at least not yet. And so Shanks dealt with an admiral, an admiral who'd just been pretty hyped up by just letting out some hockey from a distance. It doesn't get much more hype than that. Now back to the past, and I know he was only 27 at the time and was not as strong as he is now, but still, I love how such a strong dude chose not to absolutely wreck a weak bandit after he spilled a drink in his face. Here we have a guy who must be one of the strongest pirates in the world, even at the age of 27, and he let a random bandit make him look like a weakling, as Luffy put it. Even at 27, he had nothing to prove to anyone. He had no ego about the situation. He understood that needless killing doesn't make you a man. Just because that guy threw a drink in Shanks' face, it doesn't mean that he actually hurt Shanks in any way. Shanks understood that one can only be offended if they choose to be offended, and he was above all that at the young age of 27. Truly an amazing character and role model. Even at 39 years old, Shanks was the youngest Yonko until only recently when Luffy became a Yonko too. And I think I probably speak for most of us when I say that Shanks showing up and putting a stop to the war at Marineford was one of the most epic and amazing moments in anime. Albeit a lot of people were injured, but it's amazing how none of the Marines or even Blackbeard dared to challenge him, at least not yet, as people keep saying. If that doesn't set him up as being extremely powerful, I don't know what does. Even before the war, he got Kaido to turn back, showing that he even had sway over the so-called strongest creature in the world. And when Kaido briefly thought of the strongest strongest characters who could challenge him, Shanks was one of the faces who came to mind, along with Odin, Zebek, Whitebeard and Pirate King Goldie Roger. If that's not great company to be in, then I don't know what is. It's notable that Shanks was also the only living one of the five legends that Kaido thought of. In my view, when we consider that Kaido listened to Shanks and then turned back, that he places Shanks in the same category as Goldie Roger, and that Kaido lost to Luffy, I think that despite the bounty difference, Shanks is the stronger of the two. His bounty was just probably lower because he's much more low key, and even acts as a go between at times between the world government and the pirate world as we saw at the reverie. And let me just emphasize this, it's very noteworthy that Shanks, even as a Yonko, could get an audience with the Five Elders, who are the public heads of the Celestial Dragon and World Government. That is how much insane sway Shanks holds over this world. We also saw that near the end of the Battle of Marineford, he was able to effortlessly stop Sakazuki's punch with his sword and hockey. He also dueled against Mihawk, the strongest swordsman in the world, before he lost his arm and not only survived, but made it a fight memorable enough that not even a legend like Whitebeard could forget it. Now we don't know what exactly happened during their duel slash duels, but I'm one of the few people that still think Mihawk winning makes more sense since he's the one that holds the greatest swordsman title after all. Perhaps it was a draw, but Mihawk was the reigning champion, so he got to keep the title. Either way, I feel like most people underestimate Mihawk, just saying. But back to Shanks, and what's more, Kaido has a devil fruit, Big Mom has a devil fruit, Blackbeard has two devil fruits, more recently the devil fruit using Luffy and Buggy became Yonk, but Shanks doesn't possess any devil fruit power. He stands alone in this regard. This just makes all of his accomplishments, his hockey mastery, and his reputation seem all the more impressive. 
So that is what we know about Shanks. Not only can he use all three types of hockey, he arguably has the most powerful hockey in the series. We've never seen him go all out, but that just builds all the more hype around his character. Next, let's go with Luffy, our protagonist and one of the two freshest Yonko to hit the scene. He became a Yonko after defeating the so-called strongest creature in the world and the Yonko with the highest bounty at the time, Kaido. I already mentioned how much Kaido was hyped up during his part. Remember all of the if it's a one-on-one -on -one bet on Kaido stuff, and yet Luffy beat him one-on-one. -on -one. And again, I don't care about all those people commenting furiously that other characters heard Kaido first because as I mentioned, he was still in great condition for Kaido when he and Luffy started their solo battle part, and he was even beating Luffy for the majority of the fight until Luffy awakened his devil fruit power. At this point, we found out that Luffy didn't actually have the Paramecia rubber fruit, but the myth Mythical zone sun god Nika fruit. The five elders describe the myth of Nika as follows, possessing a body with the properties of rubber and fighting in whatever way he fancies, bringing smiles to the faces of the people, the warrior of liberation, also known as Nika the sun god, awakening brings his rubbery body greater physical strength and freedom. It is said that in all the world, there is no power more ridiculous, end quote. This is Luffy's gear 5, and on a side note, if you want to see a breakdown of all the other gears, we made a video on that specific specifically link in the description. But Gear 5 is the big one here that awakened the true nature of his fruit and helped him to beat Kaido. Luffy did many seemingly impossible things in this form, including stuff like turning into a giant and using Kaido's aforementioned giant dragon form as a jump rope, catching and launching lightning bolts, creating a fist so big that it made Kaido look small, rubberizing and pulling up the floor beneath himself to reflect Kaido's blast breath back at him, and so on. In this form, practically anything seems to be possible, like punching an opponent through the face without killing them, and even grabbing their nose with your hands that just shot out from inside your opponent's eyeballs. And somehow your opponent's eyeballs stretch and revert back to normal. By tunifying himself, others, and the world around him, Luffy can pretty much do everything you see in the old Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner cartoons. And keep in mind, this was only the tip of the iceberg. We're sure to see a lot more creative things from this form, which is seemingly only limited by Luffy's imagination. Then there's Luffy's hockey skills. Oda made it clear that although Luffy's Devil Fruit is the most ridiculous in the world, Devil Fruit powers alone, no matter how special, will never be enough to become Pirate King. Kaido himself pointed out that hockey is more important, so much so that many of the strongest characters in the series, like Goldie Roger, Shanks, and even Mihawk, don't even need a Devil Fruit power. In the end, it was Luffy's advanced hockey that allowed him to beat Kaido. It is because he learned to emit hockey that he was able to overcome Kaido's final flame dragon form. Otherwise, he would have had to make physical contact to hurt Kaido, and that would have just led to the burning and even melting of Luffy. Luffy can use all types of hockey, including armament, observation, and conqueror's hockey, and more importantly, he's constantly improving on his hockey skills. He's one of the few people of the already few conqueror's hockey users that has learned to infuse his attacks with conqueror's hockey. His hockey mastery had come to the point where, like the other Yonko, he was able to split the heavens during a clash with Kaido, suggesting that Luffy's hockey mastery is already on the same level as the strongest pirates in the world. Thus, Luffy has definitely proven that he deserves to be a Yonko now, not only influence-wise, but strength-wise as well. After he beat Kaido, his bounty only went up to 3 billion berries. He is the Yonko with the lowest bounty, and that bounty number is criminally underrated. He has the same bounty as Kid and Law, who had to work together to beat an arguably weaker Yonko with a lower bounty than Kaido's. However, the story does suggest that the government is purposely trying to not make a big deal out of Luffy in the public's eye. In other words, they don't want the public to focus on him too much. They freaked out when Luffy's Gear 5 picture was printed, which proved that they want to keep the narrative of Luffy under control. They couldn't not give Luffy a higher bounty after what he did, but they could spin it as a team effort, one where Luffy is just one of three up-and-comers and not that special in and of himself. The reason the government is doing this has been clearly explained. The sun god, also called the warrior of liberation, is a symbol to the oppressed and the more attention Luffy gets, the more likely people will realize that the sun god is real, that he has returned, and this will encourage them to rise up against the oppressive world government, which is the organization's worst nightmare. Because of the unique threat Sun God Luffy poses to the royal government, I think that if they were being honest, Luffy would have gotten the highest bounty in history after awakening his fruit and defeating the Yonko with a 4.6111 billion bounty in a one-on-one -on -one fight. 
But moving on, last but not least, we have Buggy D Clown, as I like to call him. To be fair, we don't actually know that he's a member of the D Clan officially, so that's just an unofficial name for now. Currently, he's being called Buggy the Genius Jester, and has a higher bounty than Luffy currently at 3.189 billion berries. How could he have gotten a higher bounty than Luffy, you may ask? Did he awaken his Devil Fruit too? Did he beat a Yonko too? Nope, not at all. As usual, Buggy stumbles into looking like a boss. This is not to take away from his natural leader charisma, which is definitely a strength of his. He has a lot of loyal followers that rally behind him and look up to him, which is very useful. But we can't ignore the fact that Buggy became a Yonko based on incorrect or misunderstood information. Because of the way the Cross Guild organization poster was printed, it looked like Buggy was in charge of the dangerous organization that has done the genius thing of putting bounties on the heads of the Marines. In reality, the organization is co-led by Mihawk and Crocodile, but the poster made it seem like these two legends were working under Buggy. And given the fact that Mihawk has a bounty of 3.59 billion berries, it's easy to understand why people would assume that his leader should at least have a bounty of 3.189 billion. If anything, it's unorthodox that Buggy's bounty isn't higher. Personally, I get why the decision to make Buggy a Yonko is controversial, even though I don't personally have a problem with it. No matter how you feel though, Buggy becoming a Yonko changes the meaning and associations that the word and title used to have in the series, at least for us readers. Up to now, every Yonko was a beast power-wise and crew-wise, and deserved to hold the title. But now that Buggy has accidentally stumbled into the position, the title holds less weight than it did before. However, if we think of Cross Guild as a Yonko force, with Mihawk's power, Crocodile's genius, and Buggy's charisma, then perhaps it starts to make more sense. It can't be said that Buggy is strong, as he even needed Crocodile to rescue him from a Vice Admiral, and he was ready to lick the boots of Crocodile and Mihawk if it meant his life being spared. So you can't say he's got that Luffy and Roger energy either that I sometimes refer to as Pirate King energy. However, he does have a Devil Fruit that it would only be fair to discuss, just like we discussed everyone else's powers. He has the Chop Chop Fruit, the fruit that allows him to become a splitting human. He can split his body into different pieces and control those pieces. Most pieces can float or fly too, with the exception of his feet. The fruit does make him immune to slashing attacks, so in a sense, he's like the natural enemy of swordsmen like Mihawk and Zoro. One of Buggy's limitations is that he can only control his body parts up to a certain distance, but if a body part gets too far away, he won't be able to control it anymore. Another weakness is that he feels what happens to his separated body parts, and that's led him to get tickled or even hit in the groin while he was trying to fight with his upper body. But perhaps Buggy's greatest strength so far has been luck. I know, luck is weird to bring up. Up. But like King in One Punch Man, it does seem to be a thing in Shonen Manga. And we can't deny that Buggy has been very lucky. Many times he could have met his end if people like Crocodile didn't show up and help him at the perfect time. It's hard to believe at this point that Buggy won't stumble into the position of public Pirate King 2, even if Luffy ends up being the true Pirate King behind the scenes. Things have happened so perfectly and in such a way that Buggy really deserves the title of Yonko in the public's eye. Think about it, he was on the Pirate King's crew, he's considered to be a brother to Yonko Shanks, he's viewed as the mastermind behind the prison break at Impel Down along with Luffy, Whitebeard the strongest man in the world and the man closest to One Piece asked him to team up with him at Marineford, and now they think he's the leader of an organization that includes the greatest swordsman in the world and Crocodile. Not to mention that this organization did the insane game changing thing of putting bounties on Marines, one of my favorite ideas in One Piece history. So that's Buggy for you, out of all the Yonko he's the only one not known to use any type of hockey, let alone Conqueror's hockey. Yet he's arguably luckier than any other and definitely one of the most interesting characters to follow. He's a great example of the fact that even if you're not physically strong, there are many other strengths you can possess that could benefit a pirate crew and even help shape the world. Anyways, that is it for today's video. Thanks so much for watching. Obviously, there is much more to be said about all these characters, so if you want more details on them, check out my One Piece playlist, which includes stuff like an hour-long video on just shanks channel the pirate king within and smash that like button if you enjoyed this video if you haven't be sure to subscribe and this is crucial hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future one piece videos and updates let me know what video topic you would like to see next in the comments or if you'd like to see another updated video on one of the topics i've already covered in the past thanks again for watching all the way to the end to let me know you did watch until the end until this moment drop a buggy is the strongest in the comments to confuse everybody who didn't watch the whole video and until next time, see ya Space Cowboys.